Our gospel reading for this morning comes from Matthew chapter 18, and this will also be the basis for our sermon this morning. Then Peter came up to Jesus and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me, and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also, my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. This is the gospel of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Forgiveness. Forgiveness is, is something that, quite frankly, we expect to hear about in church. Whether you're someone who's come to church your entire life, or whether you're someone that's coming back to church, or maybe this is the first time that you have ever entered into a church. The understanding, hopefully, is that the church and, and forgiveness go hand in and glove. And there is even clinical research to show the power, the benefit of forgiveness and having forgiveness in our lives. Mayo Clinic research has shown, showed us this, that when we have forgiveness for others, that we have less stress, lower blood pressure, improved heart health, less depression, higher self-esteem, overall healthier relationships. It's been said that holding a grudge is like drinking a cup of poison and expecting the other person to get sick. <laughs> Forgiveness is, is essential for us. And we generally agree on that point, that forgiveness is a good thing. But that doesn't make it easy. When someone sins against me, 
<laughs> the reactions that I have can be uh, visceral, can be palpable, can be tangible, right? I have e an emotional response. I'm humiliated in front of a crowd of people. How dare that person say that about me? I, I can start to see what's the saying, see red, right? And you just start not only emotionally feeling whew, your blood pressure going up, your heart racing faster, uh, you, you feel that physically and mentally, mentally, oh, after someone has, has hurt you, you can dwell on what they said, on what they did over and over and play it over in your head and, and think about what you should have said and next time I'm going to say this and oh, it can be all consuming, When someone sins against us, it can hurt us relationally. That's it. I'm done with that person. And we kick them out of our lives. When someone sins against me, I've also recognized it impacts me spiritually. Ever notice? It's really hard to pray to God when you are holding a grudge against someone else. You have probably been sinned against if you've been alive for more than, you know, three seconds in this world. <laughs> uh, maybe your parents are overly critical, and every time you get together, they're nitpicking. Why do you do this? Why do you raise your kids like that? Why don't you uh, uh, clean better? What, you know, whatever the case may be. Oh. Or maybe it's a bully, a bully in school, a bully uh, uh, that's a neighbor, someone who picks on you, calls you names, hurts your feelings, someone you've maybe even been in a, a fist fight with. Maybe it's an incompetent boss. If that guy just had any clue of how to run this business, I could save myself tons of time, be with my family instead of working all this overtime on the weekend. This is ridiculous. He's sinning against you. Maybe you've been a victim of sexual abuse. And that has impacted your relationships going forward. Let's call it what it is. Maybe, maybe a pastor has sinned against you. <laughs> and you think, how can I ever listen to the Word of God preached from that person again? And as I name these things, I'm guessing I see some heads nodding, elbows. Hey, <laughs> makes us think of something, right? We know how hard forgiveness can be. We are in a sermon series right now called, I Will Build My Church. This is Jesus' statement from Matthew chapter 16, just a couple chapters uh, before this, and it's worth noting, and I've, we've noted a few times over the past few weeks, that the Matthew's gospel, the gospel of Matthew, we've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all right, but the gospel of Matthew is sometimes referred to as the church's gospel, right? The, the church is only named, the word church is only said is only written in Matthew's gospel, both uh, here in Matthew 18 and then in Matthew 16. Not only that, but what we are currently in, Matthew chapter 18, is one of the five discourses or teachings or sermons of Jesus found in the book of Matthew, seemingly around which Matthew structures his gospel. Uh, this is the fourth of five, and this is the sermon or teaching discourse that's often referred to, to as the discourse to the church. When we think of building the church, initially 
we might think in, in terms of construction, right? Brick and mortar. And my father was a carpenter, carpenter so that's something I, I think in quickly. We may think of building the church in terms of business practices, maybe handling finances or marketing and, and getting people to come to our, our church. But when Jesus says, I will build my church, he's speaking in terms and thinking in terms of relationships. Relationships with God, our relationship with God, and our relationship with other disciples, other followers of Jesus. And it's Jesus' church, so uh, we should probably default to his understanding of what it means to build his church. He does the building. It's not you. It's not me. It's, it's Jesus who builds the church. And forgiveness is an essential construction material, if you will, in building the church. In Matthew chapter 18, in our text for today, or just before our text for today, Jesus has been teaching about forgiveness. And he's given us, um, in verses 15, 16, 17, kind of what to do when someone sins against you, when a brother, a brother in Christ, a sister in Christ, when they commit a sin against you. And he gives us some steps. Now, these steps aren't to be taken literally or, or uh, just uh, step one, step two, step three, three strikes, you're out kind of thing, right? No, they, this is, there's time, there's patience, there's grace that goes in this. But what does Jesus say? He says, first, go to that brother or sister who sinned against you. And if you tell them how they hurt you and they repent, ha, you've won your brother. Job done. It's over. Thanks be to God. But if they don't listen to you, he goes on to say, all right, take a couple other people, presumably people who kind of know this situation, and go to that person again. And maybe by taking a couple others with you, that person will come around and realize, okay, what I have done has in fact hurt you, repent, and restored that relationship. If that doesn't work, take it to the church. The church, again, patiently, graciously works to restore that relationship. And if that doesn't work, Jesus tells us to treat that person like a tax collector or uh, a sinner, uh, someone that, or a Gentile, right? Someone that's just not part of the church, not part of the community of faith. Jesus has been teaching how to do this, uh, and it's worth noting here that Jesus doesn't equate forgiveness with being a doormat, right? You don't have to, uh, in order to forgive, you don't just have to let someone continue to keep hurting you and sinning against you. No, he, he's given us these guidelines, how to lovingly, graciously, and patiently deal with sin. So Peter, in light of this teaching, asks a question. Beginning of our text, Peter came up to Jesus and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times, right? And, you know, Peter's actually being fairly gracious at this point. I mean, we've heard of second chances. <laughs> Seventh chances, that's pretty good. And in that day, the teaching seemingly was that in Jewish circles that you forgive someone up to three times for a sin against you. So Peter is doubling that, adding one, gets to seven, said, should I forgive a brother or a sister who sins against me seven times? And Jesus responds, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times, or seven times 70. The Greek is a little bit ambiguous there. But whether you, you go with 77 or seven times 70, here's the point. 
it's a whole lot, right? A whole lot of forgiveness that we should be given out. And so Jesus, he calls us to, to give this sort of, of forgiveness to others. But then he doesn't stop there. He, he shares a story, a parable, a kingdom parable to help clarify and elaborate on his point. Should have shown you these screens before, but I didn't. All right, I'll try to catch up with myself. There's a king, a master. He's collecting his debts, and he finds someone, one of his servants, who owes him a whole lot of money. Now, the text here says 10,000 talents. Like, the only way that someone could owe that much, I mean, this person had to be like, like a governor of a province or something to have that much wealth that they were in debt by. It's just, it's a crazy, absurd amount that this person owes the master. And the master, his initial reaction was, well, I'm going to make him pay. Throw him in jail. Throw his wife in jail. Throw his children in jail. Sell his possessions. And the servant begs for mercy. Be patient with me, and I will repay you. Which we know. He's not going to repay him. <laughs> there is no way that he's going to repay how much he owes. But the master, being gracious, forgives the entirety of that debt. <sighs> that same servant who had just been forgiven goes out and finds someone that owes him some money. Now, how much does that person owe him? It's, it's 100 denarii. So in our terms today, we, we can say it's not a small amount, but it's certainly much, 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 much less than 10,000 talents. 100 denarii to 10,000 talents, we're talking about a 1 to 6,000 ratio of uh, difference, right? So, so it's not a small amount. It, it's like someone, maybe they owe you, the debt they owe you is the price of a condo in Summit County, but the debt you've been forgiven has been the entirety of Summit County, including every single house, every single vehicle, every single boat, every single resort in Summit County. Like, it's really, you can't compare, okay? However, this wicked servant goes out and he says, I need that money. And he strangles his fellow servant. And he throws him in jail. And he's not merciful, even though that fellow servant pleads using the same words, be patient with me and I will repay you, which in this case is possible. Be patient with me and I'll repay you. And the other servant has nothing to do with it. Master gets word of this and says, you wicked Servant, don't you know that when I forgave you all of that sin, all of that debt, that you're supposed to go on and, and pay it forward and forgive others? Well, you're cut off now. No more forgiveness, thrown in jail. The whole point is this, that the servant was being inconsistent in his lifestyle. He wanted forgiveness, he wanted patience, he wanted mercy, but was unwilling to, to give it. And what Jesus does with this parable is that he, he reframes Peter's entire question. Peter was thinking in terms of only his relationship with someone else. Jesus shows that relationship is part of a bigger family, which includes your relationship with God.
the quote that I've come across is by George Herbert is, uh, he who cannot forgive breaks the bridge over which he himself must pass. That one hit for me. Or maybe a, a different illustration can be helpful. You've seen one of these, electrical outlet, right? Now, being a little silly here, think of, think of, of all the uses for an electrical outlet. You plug lamps into electrical outlet. You plug tablets or devices into electrical outlets and TVs and radios and lights and you know, whatever the case may be. What if that outlet started getting a little arrogant? Ha! I've got the power. You need me. And starts thinking a little too high of himself and forgets the source of his power. What is that? A power plant, right? That doesn't just give power to a light, gives power to an entire city. That's sort of where Jesus is going. Jesus, at his last supper with the disciples, has a meal with them, and it's a meal of, what does Matthew tell us? A meal of forgiveness. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is given for the forgiveness of many. That's what he says in Matthew 26, verse 28. And isn't that exactly what Jesus did on the cross? He didn't just forgive one person's sin. He didn't just forgive one sin of one person. He forgave all the sins of all the people upon the cross. We want to talk about the the power, the source of forgiveness, we look to Jesus. We look to the cross. We look to what our Lord Jesus said as he's hanging by the very, on the cross by nails, being mocked and spit upon by the very people who put him on the cross. I saved others, let him save himself. He said he could rebuild the temple in three days. Joke, if he's the king of the Jews, let him call God and, and, and take himself down from that cross. And what does Jesus say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Talk about practicing what you preach. Jesus is the ultimate account of that. And he's done that for you. He's given you forgiveness. He's, you have been forgiven. And what does that allow you to do? It allows you, it empowers you to go out and to, to forgive others. When we come to the Lord's table, when we take the bread, when we drink the wine, once again, we're connected to the power of the cross the power of Jesus, and forgiven our sins. Thanks be to God. So the question is, what, what does it look like to forgive someone from our heart? What does it look like to forgive someone? Well, I heard a story this past week, a story, a real story, a true story that happened recently, and I think it's a really good picture of what forgiveness looks like amongst God's people. There's a man, a man in the twilight of his life, in his 70s or so, and a few years ago, I say that, let me say that again, a, a couple decades ago, his wife committed adultery. 
She cheated on him. She left him for the man she cheated on him with. And this man has been left single and lonely and hurting. I mean, could you imagine what that would feel like? Every time, every time uh, you're sitting there by yourself alone, the anger. <laughs> I imagine this man saw red a couple times. The hurt, the sadness, the tears that flow. Every time there's, there's a holiday and, oh, this is the kid's time to be with their mom for Christmas. He's left hurting. This past week, his ex-wife had a loss, her, her loss in her life was the death of the man that many years ago she had the affair on her former husband with. And she was hurting. This man who had been cheated on, who had been betrayed, who had suffered sin and injustice perpetrated against him. You know what he did? He called his ex-wife and said, I'm sorry for your loss. You know that our source, our power of comfort is in God above. Whew. That's one example of what forgiveness looks like in the people of God. Maybe for you, it's getting together with, it's calling someone that hurt you and saying, hey, praying for you today. Maybe it's telling them, I forgive you. Maybe it's, it's just lending a hand, helping out where, where you can. But the thing to remember is that the power of forgiveness is found in Christ. How many times do we think it's really hard to forgive? Well, the first step, and really our only step, is to go back to the source of forgiveness. To go back to Jesus and his cross, and once again, remember what he's done for us, how much he has forgiven us. Every time we have sinned, every time we have had a nasty thought, a dirty thought, every time we, we've said something that we shouldn't have said, done something we shouldn't have done, all those sins have been forgiven by Jesus, and Jesus empowers us to forgive others and to share the forgiveness that he brought into the world through his death and resurrection. And in this way, we become uh, conduits of the forgiveness of the Lord, which is exemplified in the life of Jesus. And what happens in a community where there is forgiveness present, where that predominates? Well, it's a healthier community. I mean, physically, Mentally, relationally, there is health and wholeness and, and reconciliation. The other thing that happens, <laughs> when there's forgiveness, Jesus builds his church. May we live as people of forgiveness, people who have been graciously forgiven, and people who graciously forgive others. In Jesus' name, amen.